Put up your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, that'll be the first passage that we turn to and read this morning, so I encourage you to invite your Bibles to open them there today. It's good to see you all here. Good to be with you. Had a good service thus far, a good class. I trust hopefully you had a good class as well. The children were full of life this morning and uh, singing so beautiful for us, so uplifting, and always a good opportunity to, to do that. It's always uplifting. Appreciate Stuart leading us in those songs. Appreciate Steve in the reading thus far. And um, all those things will tie into some of the things that we want to talk about this morning. Today's lesson number five in our series entitled, God Give Us Christian Homes. And I think that song that, that Stuart just led is very fitting because there is a habitation. And it is a wonderful place. I desire to be there. I believe you desire to be there. But one of the very key ingredients in being able to make it there is that our earthly habitation is in order with the way that God wants it to be. If our homes are set up the way that God wants them to and wants them to be, what that does, it, it puts us in the position and enables us to serve God more pleasingly and, and to serve God more, more perfectly and to just be stronger and better people, more stable people. And that's why I entitled this morning's lesson, and again, you make it entitled a lesson on marriage in a lot of different ways, but I've entitled it a godly marriage, but a stable marriage. And if it's going to be godly, if it's going to be stable, there has to be things that we're on common thought processes about, and that we're on the same line of thinking, and that we're working together to accomplish I don't know how many times I have preached on marriage over the years, and from very early on before I was ever married, I really felt silly doing that. I thought, man, I'm not even married. Um, at times, I wasn't even engaged. Okay, Julie and I were just dating. But even after we were engaged and even after we were newlyweds, I thought, man, I have no business speaking on marriage. And sadly, after all these years, I really still don't feel like I'm qualified to get up here and do this. But I do think we can look at a, a collective account of what God's Word says, of what God's Word encourages us to be as godly people and as godly Christian homes and also to have stable marriages. Marriage is the bedrock of having a good Christian home. And it says in Hebrews 13 and in verse 4 that marriage is honorable and the bed is undefiled but if, if marriage is so honorable and if it's such a good thing, then why do so many marriages fail? There are some wide-ranging statistics out there on divorce rates and different things, and I won't spend time to go through all of those this morning, but they're pretty frightening. Actually, very depressing. When you think about how many marriages just don't make it and why. Well, hopefully this morning we can talk about some things that will help us to have more stable marriages in God's sight. I have a lot of young married couples here. Uh, we have some married couples with younger children like Julie and I. Uh, as I've said just a moment ago, really and truly, I don't know that I should be the one up here preaching this. Some of you have been married for longer than I've been alive, and you should be experts by now. You would probably tell me different. But you've probably got it figured out much more than I do. So maybe you should be up here as well. But regardless of where you're at and, and how long you've been in the marriage and and, and what the history thereof may be. Let's all take a collective look this morning into what God's Word says, and let's strive to have better unions in this life. To begin with, and these are just some general things. I know we could probably get more specific, and, and we really don't have the time to go through it all. But I just want to look at four things this morning, I think, that just kind of gives you a good overview of, of what that stable marriage should look like. Number one, every marriage needs to know its purpose. And that may kind of come across as, as a little bit odd, but, I mean, anything that we do, you have to have some kind of goal. You have to have some kind of purpose. And I believe that goes along with marriage as well because marriage is, is not all wedding bells and, and, and cutting the cake and, and everything looks perfect. Sometimes it's very difficult. And we've got to understand what our purpose is going into that. Or maybe at times we have to be reminded of what our purpose is being involved in that to make sure that our marriage is what it needs to be. You might say a lot of this comes really into play when you're young and when you're trying to figure out marriage and when you're trying to keep the marriage strong while you're raising children. And then after that, you just cruise on out. Well, a lot of times that's where some problems really come in. 
Because a couple will get so involved and so, in, in, I, would, I wouldn't want to say entrapped, but I would just say involved with raising the children that they forget about each other. And when the kids are gone, they kind of look at each other and they say, well, what are we going to do now? And I know that sounds sad, but I've, I've seen that happen quite a bit, and you probably have as well. So marriage has to have a purpose, and that purpose always has to be in place. Man was alone. As we had in the reading this morning, in the beginning, man was alone and God saw that it was not good. God did a scouting report, a scouting report of man and he said, this guy can't play by himself. He's got to have some help. He's lost. He doesn't know what to do. He can't keep up with his stuff. He don't know what day it is. He don't know what time it is. He needs a woman to get him in order. I, I say all that jokingly, but seriously, we need a woman's help. I mean, we're, we're that pitiful at times. I hate to say it, but we are. And God looked at that and he said, you know, he needs a helper, he needs a woman, so he created her. And when God looked at all that, he, <coughs> excuse me, he saw that it was good. So we understand that they'll leave their parents and be joined together. And I think it's interesting to note there that there is no shame. That reading ended this morning in, in verse 25 by saying there was no shame in that. There was a perfect spiritual and physical harmony that God was very pleased with. So God knew that man needed woman to reach the quality that he needed to be able to reach in life. So ultimately, what was God's purpose in doing this? Well, when you think about, I say man, the scripture says man, but human existence itself, what is, what is our purpose in this life? That, that is answered in a very simple verse. That we should hear the conclusion of the whole matter in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. That we should fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. Well, if that's what God expects of us as a whole, that in this life we fear Him and we keep His commandments, as we talked about with the children this morning, that we glorify God in the way that we live, then ultimately that has to be the purpose of marriage as well. That we glorify God praising God and help each other get to heaven. I told Julie that from the very get-go. Now, I've probably not kept my word on all things. I've not near been the perfect husband I need to be, but that's one thing that, that she and I shared from the very beginning. From here on out, we're going to strive to help each other get to heaven. Sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes we, our focus gets pulled on a lot of different areas but our purpose in this life is to serve God, and marriage can help us to do that a lot better if it's set up right. Every marriage needs to know its purpose. The husband and wife must be close physically and mentally. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what does that passage say? Very familiar passage, we know it, but what does it say? Well, Paul says there, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I become as a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith that I can remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. He goes into some pretty impressive things there to say, I can do all these good things for God, and I can, I can do all these great qualities and bring all these things out of my life, but if I don't have true love, if I don't have that agape, unconditional love with purpose, he says, I'm wasting my time. I am nothing. I want to point out something to you, and we can make a whole other lesson about just that one word, agape love, the unconditional love with purpose. But I want to point out something to you, and I think this is very important. The reason that we have to love with love with purpose is because of this. Well, we oftentimes use this phrase, well, you know, we fell in love when, or we fell in love then. Well, if you fall in love, folks, you can fall out of love. So it can't just be a whim. It can't just be a, a, a moment of passion that you just say, man, I just love this person so much and I'm just blown away by them. It really can't be just a time or a season in your life to say, I love this person for now until something else comes up. Sadly, that's the way this world works many times. No, we'll fall out of love if we don't have a purpose. Things change. Looks change. Bodies change. Sometimes our personalities change. We change as a whole the longer we live on this earth. It takes a toll on us. And if love doesn't have a purpose, 
if it doesn't have a goal, if it doesn't have an end means, if it is not unconditional and becomes very conditional, guess what? You'll fall out of love one day. And that's a problem. Love is not just something that you say. Love is something that you do, and love is something that you live. That's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, I understand there may be times that you may butt heads and you may not see eye to eye and you may need to have some time by yourself. He says, do that, that you may have time for prayer and fasting and that you draw closer to God. But he also says to come back to one another soon because of your lack of ability to control your physical desires. In other words, you need to physically love each other and you need to spend time with each other and you need to meet those needs as well. Some of the wisest advice that I've ever heard is the idea of to never stop dating, to never stop courting, to never stop trying to impress each other. Again, I'll give it to you, it is, it's hard when you have children to, to, to try to keep that, but you've got to find some way, somehow to do that. We've got to have that desire to continue to pursue that person as we probably once did and to have that love that keeps us going both mentally and physically. Again, things shouldn't stop with I do. I'm afraid so many times when people get married, they say, I do, and the other says, I do, and shortly thereafter they say, well, I did, but I just don't anymore. No, I do is forever. I do is forever. That's the way it should be. And we should say I love you and we should show I love you. We shouldn't be like the old couple that had been married for years and years and the wife came to her husband and she says, you just never tell me you love me anymore. Do you even love me? And he says, I told you that when we married on our wedding day and if anything changes, I'll give you an update. Why do I have to tell you? Well, why did he have to tell her? Because she needs to hear that. Do we understand that? We're going to look at a lesson that just specifically talks about so many things that a husband needs to do and also the wives as well. But that's one thing that a woman needs. She needs to hear that. Us guys, we could, I mean, we could care less sometimes. And we probably do think that. I've told you that once, and I'm, I mean, if anything changes, I'll give you an update. But she needs to hear that. Because she needs to know that she's being pursued. She needs to know that she's being loved deeply. You have to have a purpose. And love is purposeful. Secondly, every marriage needs to know its dangers. And I would go as far to say every marriage needs to know its enemies. And I don't say this jokingly, but the enemy should not be your spouse. Okay? Your spouse is not a punching bag. They're not a target. They're not a, a, a pop-off valve or a pressure valve that you just blow up on because you've had to hold it in all day. That's not why they're there. They're there to communicate and talk, to get things off your shoulders, yes, but they're not there for abuse. They're not there to turn on because you don't feel like you can lash out at anybody else. Every marriage needs to know its dangers. Every marriage needs to know its enemy, but it should not and should never be each other. Sadly, sometimes that's what happens. And you know what? The devil wants you to fall short. We talked about Genesis chapter 3 not too long ago that the devil is out to tear down your harmonious, godly, Christian home. And guess what? He's wanting to do the same thing to your marriage. If you don't believe me, just look around. The devil hates a couple who is on the same page, serving God, praising God, raising their children for God, and fighting for the Lord's army. He hates that, and he's hated it from the very beginning. That perfect marriage that God created in the beginning with Adam and Eve, he couldn't stand it. In fact, he couldn't sit around any time and not do nothing. He interjected himself right into that situation. And I've often wondered, had they really realized that there was a temptation from this serpent, that, there, that, that this was wrong and sin and that there was a, a disobedience at stake here and realized how terrible it was, if they were mindful of who the enemy was, that there was the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life, had they been focused to say, hey, we got to fo follow God and we can't be tempted by this wrong because He's not for us. He's lying to us. He's trying to call evil good and good evil. Had they realized that, I wonder if they'd have ever even messed up. You see, you've got to understand who your enemy is. 
You've got to understand who your opponent is, or else you'll never win the battle. I played ball growing up against a lot of friends growing up from different schools, and, and I kind of had this thing, and we had it together, that when, when we stepped foot on that baseball field in particular, and when I told that rubber to throw the baseball, and I'm throwing it at my buddy that's, that's, that's up there at the plate, I would shake his hand before the game and say, all right, we're not friends till the game's over. <laughs> and we said that jokingly, but it was serious. It was game on because he wasn't on my team, and I wasn't on his. We've got to understand who our opponent is or else we'll become intermingled in the battle and, and, and there'll be this, this huge loss. Do we understand that? I'm afraid we don't. Because the devil looks so good and he's so enticing. And before you know it, we're turned on each other. Remember, as a husband and a wife, you're supposed to be one. A man is to leave his father and mother, man and husband, or man and wife to be losing or leaving the father and mother and be joined together as one. Your actions affect your spouse. We're going to look at it in just a little bit that, that we can't play the blame game, but at the end of the day, whether it's right or not to blame the other, sometimes that's true. Some other part or other factor has caused the other to sin, and it should never be. You've got to understand your danger, and it can't be each other. And it definitely has to be understood that it's the devil. Secondly, marriage is honorable and the bed is undefiled. The, last, the rest of the part of that verse that I didn't mention earlier, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. A lack of commitment and quitting are off the table. One thing that I always say to couples when we sit down, if, if they've asked me to do their wedding ceremony, we will sit down and... One thing that I always bring out before we ever get to that wedding date is that option B should never be in your plan. Not to say that at some point because of factors that are unforeseen that it may not come to that point, but option B, in other words, plan B of abort mission and try something else should never be kind of, kind of over here on the side when you go into marriage. You go into marriage committed. That's what it's supposed to be. Sadly, sometimes it's not, but you're supposed to go into marriage, the way I read God's Word, committed to each other. And the idea of breaking that bond and busting off and going different ways are off the table. It's never an option. It should never be a factor. Husbands, your heart, your eyes, and your touch, again, these are lessons in and of themselves, but we'll just lay it out there very clear this morning. Your emotions and your heart and your eyes and your touch are only for your wife. There will be women that will come along that will try every way to get you to look at them. To get you to come at them. It ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. Men, think about that. Wives, same thing. Your heart and your eyes and your touch are only for your husband. There's some pretty slick talking men out there. But guess what? If he's, if he's going into that trying to steal you away... It ain't worth it, and he ain't worth it. And that's not perfect grammar, but I'm just laying it out there like I see it. It's not worth it. It's not worth losing your soul over. It's not worth losing your family over, and, and who knows what else. You need to see that as a danger, and you need to stay away from it. And I would even say don't even crack the door to temptation. The problem is sometimes temptation cracks the door to us, and, and we really can't help that sometimes. Sometimes we may find ourselves in a situation where we know we don't need to be, and it just is what it is. Joseph found himself in that in Genesis 39. Do you know what he did? Did he sit around and say, Well, <laughs> Miss Potiphar, I sure appreciate that. I, you are a good-looking woman, but, you know, I just, I just I can't do that. No, no, he didn't do that. He didn't entertain the idea. He didn't bat his eyes. He didn't fan himself and try to cool himself down. What did he do? He ran. Because he knew that as a man, he was not perfect. And he knew that if he stayed in that situation long enough, that batting of those eyes and that begging day in and day out was probably going to get the best of him. I believe Miss Potiphar was really beautiful. I don't know about you. Maybe she was really ugly. Maybe that's why he ran. I wouldn't think so. 
But I think he saw a situation there that said, if I hang in, around in this, I'm going down and she's going to take me down. We need to know our dangers and we need to get away from it as quickly as possible. A lack of communication is a huge problem. The times that I have sat down with people over the years that have had issues, I'll, I'll just be honest with you, the time that Julie and I have had issues with different things, it is always a lack of communication on something. Not getting things out in the open, not talking clearly, just kind of saying something in passing and being in a rush and not staying on the same page will always cause a problem. We've already looked at this passage, but a house divided against itself, Mark 3 and verse 25, a house that is divided against itself will not stand. If you don't communicate with your spouse, somebody else will. Guess who that is? It's Satan. You know, I say, well, how, how will Satan communicate with my spouse? Well, he transforms himself into an angel of light. And he can communicate through anybody. If you're not talking to your spouse, somebody else is going to start talking to he or she. And it's not going to be good. We shouldn't hide our problems. We should get them out there in the open. Staring at our phone constantly is not communication. We need to care about each other. We need to look into each other's eyes. We need to communicate. And we need to care more about our spouse than we do our work or our hobbies. And we need to communicate. Again, another lesson in and of itself, but suffice it to say, talk to each other. Talk to each other. Most therapy that you go to, most counseling that you go to, do you know, you know what that, that's all geared around? Talking. And obviously there are people that are much more qualified to do that than I am, that, that they've been trained in different things. But at the end of the day, that's what they do. They get you to talk. Talk to each other. Communicate. Keep those things out in the open. And it's amazing how God can help you work through those things. Here's a good one. Every marriage needs to own its responsibilities. I talked about this just a little bit in class this morning. But what was the first thing that happened when God came to Adam? And he said, Adam, what's, uh, what's, what's going on here? Where are you? Why are you fastening these fig leaves? You, you realize you're naked. What would you do? What did he say? The woman you gave me. He blamed two people. He blamed the woman. And he was really brave here. He blamed God. He said, the woman you gave me, she gave it to me, and I ate. So from the very beginning in marriage, it's always been finger pointing. And what did that solve? Nothing. Man, I want you to note something, and we'll, we'll come back to you at another time, and we'll look more at you and more at me a little bit closer, actually a lot closer. But I want to point out something to you, and this will kind of set the presses moving forward. God went to Adam first. Why do you think he went to Adam first? Because he was the head of that marriage, or at least he was supposed to be. He says, you're in charge, you're the head, I'm coming to you first. Why has this happened? Man, it starts with us. It starts with us. We need to fulfill our duties and we need to be leaders. And when something has gone down, somebody's got to take, take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and fix it. Pointing fingers will never fix it. Eve blamed the serpent. Again, that didn't do any good. But I would encourage you to remember that when we're tempted and when we're drawn away, that is because of our own desires. Blaming our spouse will not help anything. So again, communicate. Be on the same page. Help each other. Don't isolate one another and say, well, this is all your fault. No, you're in this together. And man, it starts with you. Colossians 3, verse 18 and 19. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. I'll just quickly say this this morning. Men, just do your part. Just do your part. In the workplace, it's amazing how efficiently a workplace can work if everybody just does their job. You ever thought that? A lot of times you have people trying to fulfill all these roles. You know why? Because other people won't do their job. If everybody just did their job, things would be fine. Men, just do your part. And I have seen it so many times in life. I've seen women craving for a man who will just lead her because the one she has is not leading her. She wants her husband to lead. Women want to be led by their husbands. That's the way it's set up. 
But there's nothing worse than a weak, weak, weak. I mean, that's just what we have. We have weak men that are soft, that won't stand up and won't lead. And then the women have to try to stand up and lead. And guess what? They're not wired up for that. That was not God's original purpose. Is that to say they can't be good leaders? No. But in the marriage relationship, the man is supposed to lead. So men lead. Be men. Don't be soft. Don't sit back and expect her to just do everything. Lead. That's why God puts you there. On the other side of that, wives, again, just do your part. Be that virtuous woman that God encourages you to be in Proverbs 31. And don't be the contentious wife that always stirs the pot and makes everything worse. It's, it's a lot better to, to live in the corner of the rooftop than to live inside with a contentious woman. And that, there's a lot of truth to that. The things that you do can allow him to lead better. Proverbs 25 and verse 24 teaches us that. So having said all of that, understand that we've got to start owning up to our responsibilities and being responsible. And if there is a problem, fix it. Be angry in Ephesians 5 or 4 verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. You know what? The longer you let a problem sit, the deeper it sears into your heart and the harder it is to fix. If there is a problem, husbands, wives, fix it. And fix it today. Don't let it keep living. The roots get deeper, the corruption gets more, and it just gets nasty. Fix it. Own up to those responsibilities and fix it. Last point. Probably the most important one. In Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 25, everything was perfect. God saw that it was good because He had made a perfect union. It was perfect until they allowed Satan to come into it and they pushed God out. I've always found it interesting when sin entered the picture, when Satan was let in, then man was naked. Do you know why man and woman were naked at that point? It's because they were not clothed with the peace of God. You ever thought about that? They were clothed with the perfect peace and innocence of God and through God before Satan entered. And after that, they said, oh my goodness, I have messed up. Let me cover this stuff up because I am wrong. And I don't say that jokingly and I don't say that to be funny, but that's what happened. They were separated from God and they weren't clothed by His peace anymore in His perfection. The same thing will happen with your marriage. Your marriage will be what it needs to be. It may not be ideal at all times. It may not be perfect, but it will be stable when God is in it. But you push God out and let Satan in and guess what? You're unclothed without God. As long as God's in your marriage, it will survive and it will endure. One of the best poems that I've ever found. Used it so many times over the years. And I will continue to use it till I find something better, and I highly doubt it. I once thought that marriage took two, or took two to make a go, but now I'm convinced it takes God also. And not one marriage fails where God is asked to enter and lovers come together with God at the center. In homes where God is first, it's obvious to see that those unions really work for marriage takes three. Here's a visual for you. This is what marriage is supposed to look like. God is the foundation of it. Husband, connected to God. Wife, connected to God. Husband and wife, connected together. There is a bond there. There is a union there. And when they are centered on God, there's a perfect balance. Do you see how that stands up there? Think about it. Think about the physics of that just for a moment. Do you see how it stands up there? You know why? Because it's balanced. Here's the problem. When you remove God from that, what happens? There's only one thing that can happen. They can't float up there by themselves, folks. They're going to come crashing down. And that's what happens when you take God out of it. Again, see that? You can't stand without God. The other side of that is if the husband is not fulfilling his role, if he's not doing his job, or if he fails in his relationship with God and he kind of falls off, guess what happens to her? Can she balance that act by herself? It ain't happening. Because she has nothing connected to her to fully keep her up there. Same thing goes for the wife. If the wife kind of falls off and she's not what she needs to be to her husband and she's not what she needs to be to God, guess what happens to the husband? There's no balance for him either. 
When you simplify it down in that manner, it's, it's, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Marriage takes three. And to prove that point even farther, when you read Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll look at this a little bit deeper later on, but it talks about wives submitting to your husbands and husbands loving your wives as what? As Christ loves the church and gave Himself for her. That union between Christ and the church has withstood the test of time. And so will your marriage if God stays the center point. If you both stay connected to each other, and you both stay connected to God. The lesson this morning is very simple. You've got to know your purpose in marriage. Understand that. Be aware of that and work on that together. Understand that you have a common enemy and it should never be each other. It will always be Satan and see him for that. And all the devices that he throws at you. Own your responsibilities. I'm going to mess up as a husband. Sometimes Julie's going to mess up as a wife, not near as much as I do, but we, we're not perfect. We, we have problems. Own those, responsib- or own those problems and, 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 and fix it. Be responsible. Stand up. Do your part. And above all, understand that marriage takes three. You remove any part of that equation, it all comes tumbling down. Let's work on these things. Hopefully you're doing well. Let's do better. And let's strive to have those Christian homes that God needs us to have. God needs us to have that because strong homes means a strong church. And that brings God glory. Let's strive to do that together. If we can help you in any way this morning to pray for you and with you, or today if you need to become a Christian, we're here to help you. If you're subject, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?